Hello everybody. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to tonight's webinar in which Dr. Alison Moore and Marcella Towler will share insights from their research project, uh, Nature Through Na Nurture Through Nature, fostering early childhood students' understanding of outdoor learning spaces. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Sharon Cleas. And I'm delighted to chair tonight's event as a trustee on the Council of Froebel Trust and also in the capacity as vice chair on the executive for the Early Childhood Studies Degrees Network. Um, and finally, as a programme lead and senior lecturer on the BA Honours Early Childhood Studies degree at Bass Bay University. I have a couple of reminders for you tonight. Um, First of all, may I ask that you put any questions that you may have in the Q&A option on the Zoom platform, please. Um, please do continue to provide comment in the chat function, uh, which will be monitored by uh, our lovely colleagues, uh, the Froebel Trust team. So without further ado, I don't want to take up any more time. I'm sure you're all ready to listen. Um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Alison Moore and Marcella Towler. Thank you for the um, lovely introduction. Um, and we'd like to thank the um, Froebel Trust, uh, firstly for the funding, but also, um, you know, for the opportunity um, of presenting tonight and sharing our research with everyone and just thank you to to everyone who's who's here this evening um uh, uh, for participating and as Sharon said lovely to have some uh, questions uh, in the Q&A um so for those of you who aren't familiar with our uh research so next slide yeah um our research has got a focus on um, the outdoor learning space in UCC in Cork. So um, I'm the uh, placement manager uh, at UCC, uh, responsible for um, on the EYCS programme and responsible for allocating all the placements across the degree. And Marcella is the course coordinator. Um, I should talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. So, so our research is this focus on our outdoor learning space um, that was completed in March 2020. Um, but our research was the first opportunity for the students at UCC and for us as, as staff and colleagues to actually um, to use this outdoor learning space. So there's just a few pictures there that we've been able to share with you. Um, as I say, if you're not familiar with it, you can see that we have a practice room. So the far left picture, we've got a practice room and we've got those lovely glass doors, um, which are open onto our um, outdoor learning space. Um, and those doors are open throughout uh, the whole of the workshops that take place in the practice room. You can see the different surfaces that we uh, provide, the gravel, the grass, um, there's balancing areas, there's a lovely tunnel um, just there, chalkboards um, and lots of different experiences that the, the students can take part in. And we wanted our, our students to really explore um, and develop their understanding of how outdoor provision can support children's development and learning. Uh, through a Fabelian lens. So we really ask them to critically reflect on their learning and developing understanding. So it's a four year degree. Uh, our research started when the students first came in um, as first years. And so they spend the whole of that first year on campus um, in various modules, uh, including um, the one that takes part in this workshop. Um, and these, that's just uh, one of the comments made by one of the student participants, because we wanted to really understand how they felt when they first walked into that setting uh, 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 for the very first time. 
and just one student here saying um, that freedom of movement with no restrictions on where you can and cannot go when moving between the outdoors and the indoor space. So that, that was lovely to hear. So our research design was divided into two phases. I'm going to um, explain a bit more about that. Uh, and it's now completed, as you can see from the slide. So phase one, as I said, took part on campus. Um, students started in the September and our research started in the February of 22. There was, um, it was part of an education module. It says here the ED, education, 10, 12 module. And on that was 100 students starting that, starting that module. Um, and we reached out with several information sessions, inviting students to contribute to the research. And we recruited 14 students to participate in that research. Um, it's really important at this point to um, talk about some of our ethical considerations um, uh, that we have to think about as part of the research. Now, so it's part of their studies, it's part of their early degree module, um, and we had to be mindful of that, that all 100 students were taking part in this module, only 14 of them were participating. So right from the beginning, Marcella as the course tutor on that module, uh, was not made aware of which students had uh, consented to take part in the research. It was really important that the students understood that taking part or not taking part, it was purely voluntary in this research would not impact on their, um, their module, their grades, how their portfolios would be marked. So Marcella uh, was not uh, made aware of that and the students um, always knew that right from the start. Um, so uh, Marcella uh, was not aware of the 14 students until their portfolio came in. I'm going to explain more about the portfolio. Um, and their grades were given and awarded. And then Marcella um, was made aware of the students. And similarly, we phase two, um, uh, when they went into placement. So the students then go into placement in the following January. Um, and we recruited from the original 14. And we managed uh, 10 students from that original 14 came forward. And equally, our ethical considerations with that, um, I use the same process as I would use for placing any student in their um, settings, a range of settings. I would place them and then we went back to see uh, where the 10 students were actually placed. So that did not influence uh, where I where I allocated a placement for them because a lot of that is based on geographical uh, location where they live, transport, um, and also some of their career paths that they want to take. So um, that's really important to say that. Um, and we also invited the placement representatives and the mentors into an information session in phase two. So the students weren't observing children or staff in the settings. Um, but we really wanted the settings on board and we still um, had ex consent from the settings. And we wanted to share our findings from phase one uh, with the mentors. Um, and that was a really good way of uh, starting the relationship with the mentor and the student who was taking part. And again, always making the links back to Froebel and Froebelian principles and activities, reassuring that they were not observing children and they were not observing staff. Um, and I'm going to explain a bit more about what they what they did research. So our research was a, an interpretive approach using qualitative research methods. As I said, applying that critical reflective model, uh, making that distinction between reflection on an event and reflection after an event. We refer to um, in phase one and two, we held focus group interviews um, in phase one, uh, as that was just towards the end of uh, COVID and we still had COVID restrictions in place at UCC, those, those focus groups were done online. But fortunately in phase two, we could have face-to-face -face focus groups. Um, so that was really good. In phase one, we had reflective maps and you can see an example here um, of that. We adapted that from empathy maps. Some of you may be, uh, aware of that method. We really wanted to understand how students were engaging with our outdoor learning space, 
engaging with the resources, uh, engaging with each other, um, and really their emotions and how they felt. Uh, that reflection, um, reflective on practice was so important. They had their reflective portfolio in phase one. Um, so they reflected on all the workshops uh, that they took part in. And then in phase two, uh, we had reflective journals or zines. So uh, we gave the students, the 10 student participants, we gave them this journal um, to record their reflections, what they noticed of the outdoor space in their placements. And, and you'll see from the findings a bit later, uh, some of that was very different. Um, so they've gone from to fuse their theory to their practice. What did they learn and develop their understanding of outdoor learning spaces while in college? And then what are they noticing when they go into placement? Um, they could write narrative, they could draw, they could write poetry. We did not describe how they were going to write these reflective journals or, or the maps. Um, and there's just one illustration there on the far right uh, of one student um, that did illustrate throughout the whole of her uh, reflective journal. And then we use thematic, anal thematic analysis as a method of developing and analysing and interpreting all this rich data uh, that we received um, in that data collection. And I'd like to share just a few quotes um, in the time that we have available about students using those methods. So those reflective maps and the journals. Um, and again, it really was about this freedom. Uh, they helped the children, students to articulate at the exact moment in the workshop. It helped them, reminded them um, of how they felt at the time of being outdoors, um, how they were you know, being um, engaging with uh, their peers and, and being able to record that on those reflective maps was really important to them. Um, so they didn't forget, they didn't forget um, what they had done during the workshop. And then the reflective journals, you can see here just a few um, comments from participants. Um, it was, it was uh, kind of productive using writing to learn. Whereas now I can observe, I can actually draw things, I can use visuals, such a range of ways that students learn. Uh, and she just gave to go and it kind of came together, which is a lovely expression. Um, and then I liked there was no set way of how we had to describe things. We got to make it up however way we wanted to show what we were observing. And again, later when you see the uh, some of the findings, developing those skills of observing uh, was really important and those reflective skills. So students really enjoying the freedom and the creativity. So I just want to expand more on reflection. So when we, when we first set out on the research and we designed these research methods, um, we weren't sure if they were going to be um, effective and effective tools um, for students to reflect and for us to collect data. Um, but we have been able, we're so fortunate that the students engaged throughout um, and really used these tools of, of reflection. Uh, and particularly the effective maps in, in phase one. All of the students were able to say that their skills of reflection and reflective practice were strengthened by participating in the research, having that freedom of expression, that creativity, and again, um, always reflecting through a Fabelian lens. Um, and you can just see a few comments here from uh, the students. It just gives you the chance to kind of stop and think about what you saw during the day, um, referring to the observations in placement. And being part of the research helped me to do the reflections on my observations. So not only conducting observations, but that real skill of then um, analysing, interpreting uh, what, they're, what they're seeing and then linking it to the pavilion principles. So um, I'm going to hand over to Marcella, who's going to continue to share some of our findings. Thanks, Alison. Um, and you're after setting the scene very well for us there. And we really tried to put our findings in a summative format. And the word we came up with was growth. Um, and really, this represented 
the professional and personal growth of the students, but also of Alison and I as researchers and as educators. It's really showing how students reflected deeply on their understanding of outdoor learning spaces and also their approach to Frobelian education. And also the, the word growth represented the nature based aspects that were either absent or present in some of the settings the students went on placement to. Um, however, this evening, you know, we, we want to just move away from teasing that out and the full detail will, of course, be in our report on that. And we want to focus more on three um, key areas. And I think we call these outcomes in the report, but uh, three key areas. So Alison has kind of set the scene there, if you like, for that individual reflection and for the reflection, dis reflective discussion with peers. And that really underpinned everything that we were doing. So in focusing on these three key areas, we want to give some um, examples of those first-hand experiences that students had both in the workshops in college and then on their placement. And we also want to um, show the joy really that they got from nature, that idea of enlightening hearts and minds and some of the ideas that came through on that. Um, and, and really just to highlight that emergent curriculum, if you like, and of course, because it's research founded by the, the Ferbal Trust, we, we want to emphasize that aspect as well. And Wasmuth would remind us that being a Ferbellian in the 21st century really is about familiarizing future and veteran professionals with Ferbellian principles so they can um, reflect on their role as educators and advocates for young children's learning. So we want to keep the Ferbellian aspect in mind and also show you how we laid some foundations um, in relation to Ferbelian education for those budding educators of the future. So when we set about to do this research, um, Alison and I really didn't know where it was going to go. Um, and we also had to do the day job, as it were. And while we facilitated and the research process and we organized and we analyzed the data, we really do have to stress at this time that the insight came from those student reflections. So um, it really is their webinar as much as it is ours tonight. And um, we, we thought this quotation from, from Frebel, and it, it's a, relating to his visits to Pestalozzi when he said he was teacher and scholar, educator and pupil all at the same time. And we felt that this really represented our own roles in the research. So we had to step back from our respective roles as professional practice place manager or lecturers and we had to then also become partners in the pedagogy. So it brought to mind really our own thoughts on education. And we have this quotation from Frebel, and it's really about learning through doing. And this applies to both the workshops in semester one in or in the first phase, in our first phase of our study, and also on their the placement experience. And you know, there's a little bit more to this idea of learning through doing. And it's going further into Frebel, and he would tell us in The Education of Men that the purpose of teaching and instruction is to bring even more and more out rather than putting more and more into. And this is the philosophy we had behind the workshops. So the pedagogy that was used in, in phase one in our workshops, it was a long time coming around and it predates the research. And just as the lecturer on this module to say that this didn't happen overnight. So it was a long time coming, the change. But what the research gave us an opportunity to do was to document that change. So in Ireland, we work under Ashter, which is the early childhood curriculum framework. And Ashter is the Irish word for journey, which really represents what we were about. And in Ashter, an emergent curriculum is promoted. And in lectures with my students, my hundred students over the years, I was telling them about emergent curriculum. And I was telling them, go and do the readings on emergent curriculum. And yet when I had them in small groups, I was doing the complete opposite. Um, and really, I was disguising the play in those workshops. I was disguising the activities as play. And, you know, I've, I've previously referred to, to Brock and this idea of kind of chocolate dipped broccoli. There was no good in it. I was still the lecturer. I was still deciding what students were going to learn, what they were going to play with and how they were going to play with it. And I had this tremendous sense of unease with that. Um, and I was trying to change that, you know, over time. And it took a while and it did take um, 
some change in it. I suppose there was a little bit of resistance to that. But with our new four year degree coming on, we had discussed this um, as uh, with our colleagues in the School of Education and Dr. Maura Kaneem, one of the co-directors, and this change in education and pedagogy approach came about. So it predates the research, but as I said, the documenting of that research, it really gave us an opportunity to do that. So Frebel will tell us that really the training for those working with young children has to be imbued with a childlike spirit. And that was really the approach then that we took to the workshops. And we've got that lovely idea here, again, coming from Frebel, that you need to be more passing and passive and following and not prescriptive, categorical and interfering. And we can see here with the students' quotations from the first phase of the research, this approach to the workshops and how they felt about that. So their sense of enjoyment, they're feeling very free when they're outside, roaming around and getting to explore and, you know, being able to interact freely with the materials without any, any intervention from myself. Now, Alison already explained there's that lovely link and flow between our outdoor and our indoor space. And with those doors open, really, it was quite free. Materials were available. So there's that link and flow to go inside or outside, bring in materials, bring out materials. Um, and really, in those workshops, the curriculum became what happens. So there was no plan. So the only the only plan we have and continue to have is that the workshop will start and end at a particular time and what's going to happen i have no idea and that is the sheer joy of it um and we go from there and we reflect on what happens as we go so within our research um there was a lot of um creatures that came up and we call them biodiversity buddies in our report but it really was based a lot around nature and Frebel gives us that lovely description in the education of men of children returning from their rambles and they're bringing, you know, treasures of unknown stones, plants, worms, beetles, spiders and lizards that dwell in darkness and concealment. And the adult will tell them, you know, it's horrid, put it down. And the boy of six years old may tell you about the structure of the beetle, beetle and the peculiar uses of its limbs, things that you didn't know before. And this fits really with some of the examples that came out in the research. And the first example I'm going to give you, this little interaction that happened in one of our workshops. And we can see here, the student is asking, does the slug have many teeth? Because the snails have many teeth. And the interaction she had with myself that I didn't know, which I didn't at the time, and, you know, we can find out together. And she says she was afraid that the slug would be eaten by the bird. But Marcella told me this is nature. So just before the kind of idea of um, do slugs have teeth starts trending, I'm going to answer the question. And yes, they do. But I didn't know that at the time. Um, and they have, they have thousands of microscopic teeth, as anyone who, who has planted um, things that have been eaten by slugs will know. So at the corner of the slide there, you will see, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy the slug is still alive. The, the student put in, in the reflective map and, and the bigger quotation is from the portfolio. So I do have to kind of reassure you that no slugs were harmed during this research. And of course, during research, we can't do everything. So while I can assure you the slug was not eaten and it was intact at the end of the workshop, the long term welfare of that slug, I'm afraid, was beyond the scope of this research. So from slugs to snails, we will move on. So another one of our biodiversity buddies. And this time we've got this student who has found the snail and it's poking its head out and it takes them back to when they were a child. And the little rhyme that they had with their father about the snail being tempted to come out. And then the student in the portfolio continues there to make a link to, to Frebelian ideas there. Um, and it, it's the first of many really of these reminiscences as we've called them that came through. So there, um, there was another lovely one as well that you'll see in the report about a student remembering planting bulbs with her mother when she was a young child. Um, and these kind of nature-based reminiscences demonstrate that sensory potential of first-hand experiences in the outdoors during workshops. And it, it brings to mind this lovely idea 
that Martina Killian has, and she talks about walking in nature and having these sensory flashbacks. And we can really see those sensory flashbacks coming through in our data from the students. We also had a lovely idea coming through from a student of being in that outdoor space. And the student said, for me, it was very relaxing. So it was somehow like home. Um, and when she referred to being in that outdoor learning space. And really, we're seeing these kind of glimmers, as we've called them in the research. And they're those little moments of joy and contentment that students can get from nature. And, um, you know, students have, have talked about this in their placement experience as well. And one student has talked about a deja vu moment where they were a child and they stuck out their tongue to catch the summer rain. And they did the same thing during their professional practice placement, sat on the grass all happy and content and was at peace. So again, we're getting those lovely ideas of nature coming through. Now, I'd like to just pause before I refer to the slide that's on screen and just bring us back to Frebel's own words, because I think it's important to come, come back to the, the original. And, you know, these ideas that are coming through here and we can see that Frebel says, the more intimately we attach ourselves to nature, the more she glows with beauty and returns us all our affection. And we can really see that in the ideas coming through from our students. So in this slide here, you can see more of our biodiversity bodies. And we have that idea of the ladybird coming through. And the student really is taking on board here that the questions you come across indoors are not the same as the ones you come across outdoors. And we can see that this student really has taken on board the idea of that nature nurturing an emergent curriculum and that the, the child will be stimulated by a ladybird or whatever it is that they see outdoors. So students have taken this nice idea of emergent curriculum into their placement settings with them as well. We also had another biodiversity buddy and this one, it was the spider. And this is a lovely, uh, recollection from a student who spotted spider a spider's egg sac and drew some lovely pictures of that and the student goes back and forth to that spider's egg sac with the children and starts checking it and also then finds a second web and then that middle picture there there's a bigger spider and the student assumes it's the parent spider minding the web and um, then one day the student goes back to the spider's eggs and they've changed their appearance. And the student has done much research in these journals in, on placement. And you can see they've gone and looked up the type of species of the spider, and it's really developing into this real connection with nature. And you can really see the connection with nature from the words that are used on the side, and maybe you can't read them, but I like how the student described my spider's eggs. So the student has now taken ownership of these spider's eggs and is really feeling a connection to them. However, um, there were two spiders webs and on one day the student went back and there was a break in one of the webs and you may now be wondering what's actually going to happen as Alison and I were as we read these journals and there's that idea of a hunch we might have a hunch about what happened and that then is bringing into this idea of us that Frevel's idea of their surmise. So it's that idea of children have early ideas or something and they have hunches about something. So you may have a hunch about what happened, those spider's eggs, and we may come back to that in a minute or we may not. So it's good to have a hunch about something. And this is bringing us on to this idea of our students' understanding of their a Frebelian approach. And um, they had what we called assumptions. And we didn't like to say inaccuracies because this was the start of a journey and it's going to continue. So we felt the word assumptions were going to fit better. And the process of really this, this journey, we can see here one of the students very early on in the first phase of the research is, has this assumption that a Frebelian approach to education is a particular type of setting and refers to the fact that because they hadn't attended this Frebelian type of setting, that the workshop gave them the opportunity to experience a type of curriculum that was not normal. Now that always brings a smile to my face. Um, and then we can also see in phase one, another student uh, talking about the child initiated and connectedness element of Frebel in the outdoors. And, you know, the outdoor spaces have that sense of unity as well. 
And then as the students um, moved on and maybe used some Frobelian type materials. And just to clarify that, I suppose the gifts and occupations were there as a choice of material. It wasn't emphasized to the student whether they should use them indoors or outdoors. In this example, they were used indoors, but there was no um, no objection to them taking them outdoors. Nobody did take them outdoors during the research, but they have since. Um, so we can see here the student making a connection to a Frobelian approach and making that connection through what they made themselves with the chair and the throne. And that came from their childhood and fairy tales and then linking it to the idea of forms of life in a Frobelian approach. And then as our students went also on placement, we can see their developing understanding. And we can see that they're continuing to have this unfolding idea and they're still having them, these assumptions and they're trying to have a go now. And I'm not full sure if this is a Frobelian principle, but I believe it is, one student said. And the student was talking about drawing with young children. And then not only in what was present, the students also considered a, a Frobelian idea and what wasn't present. And that's really important. So they said, I haven't seen many natural, I have not seen many natural concepts like Frebel recommends. Um, so those journals were really showing a kind of continued unfolding of a Frobelian way of thinking. And there was there were explicit links to Frobelian principles. Um, and then there were also some that were implicit that we had to delve a bit, little bit deeper for. So while they weren't identified as Frobelian, excuse me, they were actually Frobelian in their approach. So what then did our students think about outdoor spaces? Um, and what was that change they had when they went from our outdoor learning space in college to the real life settings on placement? And really we can see um, here, and I'm just gonna skip back to the one there. Um, so there was a variety of settings, as Alison said, they weren't cherry picked in any way. They went to a variety of settings and some students talked about the settings they were in. So there was lots of concrete in some of them. Um, some of them had very limited outdoor learning spaces. And some of them um, had patches of grass that were taped off and, and, and children couldn't go on them. And, and that you know, brought up lots of discussion in our focus groups. In terms of the natural aspects of the setting, what our students found was when there were, wasn't a lot of nature present, they noticed that any sort of nature ideas that emerged, the children were really drawn to them. So what they spoke of was when leaves blew into the, the setting, the children were really enjoying that. Um, or things that were poking through a fence. In terms then of the sensory aspects, we had one very insightful idea, and this student was in a setting that had a very state-of-the-art, well-developed sensory room inside. And this student you know, made the point that this sensory uh, aspects of nature were not being exploited outside at all. Then there were also many um, examples of bringing the indoor activities outdoors. And we can see that quote there of Irene Lilly, you know, paraphrasing Frebel, and saying, you know, you can be outdoors all of all of the day, but that does not mean that you're engaging with nature. So in terms of other space, the other spaces then, other, other aspects, and Alison and I felt the word perceived limitations might be better than limitations because some of these can be overcome. So things like um, ar architecture constraints, so being very far away from the building when you're in the outside space, and then maybe things like access to bathrooms, not having enough staff to go back into the setting. Um, that Those ideas were, were very, very real. And ideas of maybe shared spaces that were only, a, a group was only allowed to use at a particular time or on a particular day. So there was no spontaneity in these outdoor learning spaces. And it wasn't possible to have link and flow maybe between the areas. Um, it's also important to point out our students were very conscious of being critical of their setting. And we, we speak about relationships a lot in our report and they they really you know said oh no I, did, I maybe i'm too critical about the concrete um and and they really had developed relationships with the settings and, and you know were conscious they did they were the, the staff were really doing their best another item that came up really for us was the idea that outdoor learning spaces were being used as a way of children letting off steam or using up their energy which is of course very important but maybe using this for children to run around before they have a nap and we kind of came up with the idea of the, the outdoor learning space is kind of let them out to wear them out rather than any sort of engagement with nature at all. 
And of course, um, in the structural limitations as well, we have to say there was a lot of fixed equipment like swings and slides and things like that. And Helen Toby would have, you know, remind us that really a Frobelian setting um, has materials that can be transformed rather than preformed materials. And of course, um, what came up quite a bit was the weather. Now we live in Ireland and I'm not sure where many of you were tuning in from tonight, but it rains quite a lot in Ireland. And really, I think the student has the right idea here. And all we can say about this is there is no more to say about it. Children don't care about getting wet. And it's us as adults, really, that we start actually putting those ideas um, into their head that, you know, we oh no, it's wet. We can't go outside. So we need to change those mindsets. And Alison and I came up with this idea that really settings should maybe share ideas with each other of how to get around some of these structural constraints, architectural constraints. You know, how do we manage with bathrooms and forest schools? There's portable um, items you can take. So, so the, the sharing of ideas maybe in, in little communities of practice would be a really good idea to, to see how we get around these real, um, these perceived limitations. So despite all of the issues that our students thought um, about the settings, they, we, we were really pleased to, that this idea came up that no matter how big or small the site or space for really an outdoor learning can still occur. And for our students to have that insight, it's, it's really wonderful. Now, I just want to take a pause before, for the last few minutes um, and, and just to put another perspective of, on this, really. So this photograph was taken of the, set, of the outdoor space in UCC just last week. You can see how much the foliage has developed from those earlier pictures. And I usually take the picture from the other angle, and I, I don't know why I took it from this angle, but it, it reminded Alison and I to, to give another perspective on this this evening. And you may be on the other end of this webinar thinking, well, you know, that's all very fine in UCC. They have a lovely outdoor learning space. Um, and and really, you know, we want to give you some kind of insight on that. So as Alison meant, mentioned, it was ready in 2020. But I just want to give you a few a background for a few minutes before we, we conclude. And just to say that the process of this outdoor learning space began in 2016. And it was colleagues in the School of Education, Dr. Stephen O'Brien and Dr. Vanessa Rutherford, and they were applying for funding to bring um, the indoor area into the next generation, it was called, okay, so ne next generation funding within UCC. And they had the vision and they said, okay, what about an outdoor space? And then myself and another colleague, Dr. Maura Kneen and Dr. Joe Costa were brought on for maybe helping with the design of that. And it was really Steve and, and Vanessa and, and another colleague in Buildings and Estates and UCC, Michael, who actually pushed this idea through. So, um, you know, they were the ones really who set the wheels in motion. So it took four years. So between funding and building inside and outside, well, then it was March 2020 when we got this outdoor space ready for use. We were planning to go out the following week and our university went into lockdown. So it was actually another year and a half before we actually ever got in to use this with um, students. And, and and just to put it kind of into context, um, there was, you know, maybe that initial funding that had to be pushed through. And, you know, perhaps at that stage, people felt the money could be used in another uh, another way and you know there was this idea what what use would we make out of a, a, an outdoor learning space but just to have that vision and you know Frebel Frebel was as we know his ideas were revolutionary in the time at the time and he he met huge resistance and and in the recent finding Frebel book we really see how much resistance Frebel met and his ideas you know he they were called a pedagogical hoax um and that he was keeping the children busy with useless trifles. So for those of us here on the webinar tonight, um, there may be those people out there who think that our pedagogy and outdoor spaces is a pedagogical ho hoax. And I know that there are possibly people who think that I, I am keeping my students busy in the workshops with useless trifles. Um, and maybe they should be doing something more productive. But I, I'd like to remind us that for billions, have always been possibilitarians. We see the possibilities and we find the way. And, you know, as, as we can see on the screen, a good thing takes its own time. So we need lots of things coming together and outdoor learning spaces are gaining lots of momentum. Um, and, you know, even here in Ireland, our, our Tusla, our earlier inspectors, have a guidance document 
um, on for when the roof is the sky for settings who operate outdoors. And that's it's a really um, positive move going forward. Now, it's a guidance document, but it's positive that really our earlier inspectorate are acknowledging that this can be part of um, practice going forward. So the point I'm trying to make really is this is not straightforward. It is not straightforward to get students outside on a Monday morning at nine o'clock when it might be drizzling. Um, it's not straightforward to get an outdoor learning space in place. But really, just to say to you, you know, um, we will ha you know, we have to find a way to do it in our own context, wherever we are. And really, it takes um, a complex web of factors to come together to get this going. Now, we were speaking of a complex web of factors, and I did keep you hanging earlier on. So speaking of webs, I would like to bring you back to what we talked about earlier and this idea here. And I am pleased to tell you that when one of the spider's webs, the eggs did hatch. And really the, that glimmer and that moment of contentment for this student, knowing that at least one of the egg sacs hatched was really special to me. Um, and that's, that's absolutely beautiful. So really we can see so far, and before we conclude, that students' understanding of outdoor learning spaces is fostered through those first-hand experiences and also from reflecting on those experiences. And Alison and I would like to you know, say that really it doesn't matter what learning space you have, whether you have to go away from the university or not, it's the reflection and supportive reflection afterwards will, will really um, bring the most out of those first-hand experiences. So I want to bring you back to what I said earlier around education and really that idea with Freville that the purpose of education and teaching and instruction is to bring ever more out than to put more and more into. And to say that there is no way that I could, as an educator, teach that interest in those spiders, nor could I teach the insight into outdoor learning spaces that we're going to look at. Um, so I'm going to leave you with the words of a student and their wonderful insight on outdoor learning spaces um, in a poem that they wrote in their journal. So it goes like this. The outdoors holds so much power at any time, any hour, a time to be free and full of glee, a place to wander and explore, a place where you want to know more, so much to see and yet so much mystery. Join me and see all that you can be, a scientist, a researcher and more. It is up to you to explore the greatest teacher yet. Thank you. Thank you very much both Alison and Marcella for sharing those wonderful in insights around your uh, research. Um, it was lovely to see the students' reflections, particularly I've picked upon this idea of the joy in nature and being at peace in nature, how wonderful, um, and this connectedness and unity that seems to shine through your research findings. I'm really particularly impressed with you as researchers for taking into account the ethical considerations of your biodiversity buddies and that you make it very clear that you cannot account for the demise of the snail after the project ended. Absolutely wonderful uh, ethical consideration there. Um, we have got um, a question that um, the audience would like to ask of you. And um, that would be, can you share a little bit more or speak a little bit more around your um, your maps, the, the mapping, if that's possible? And maybe an example of your reflective maps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Alison, are you okay? Do you, want to, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so the, the reflective maps kind of came from this idea of a an empathy map in education where um, where you put the learner at the centre. So um, what we wanted to do was kind of switch that, if you like, 
and have the student as themselves as the learner in the center. So it's it's just literally a page divided in four. And I think Alison had it there on the slide earlier on. Um, and it's where they jot down ideas of what they're thinking and learning, what they're feeling, any interactions that they had um, during their workshops. And it's a sort of a fluid um, way of collecting ideas. And, you know, they're encouraged to just work on that as they go through the workshop. It's not just at the end of the workshop. Um, I, I try and encourage the students to jot down ideas as they come to them, because, you know, in the past, we always had reflection and workshops, but it was always, I know it's time for reflection. And, you know, we've come away from that idea we can reflect on demand because we can't. So we can jot down the ideas, but then we have to kind of metaphorically step back from that reflection. And they were the first step, I suppose, in, in the reflective process. The students then went away and when they wrote their portfolio, they actually wrote a much um, longer piece from some of those reflection maps. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, another question that has come through was around in the development of the outdoor space and some of the scepticism that you may have um, experienced in, in terms of investment for that space. Um, how do you think or what do you think could uh, help others who might be fighting for funding um, to develop spaces in the outdoor areas? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's just your passion. And as I say, um, I have to, to, to thank my colleagues for pushing the idea through and Stephen, Vanessa and Michael, because they were the ones with with the vision. But I think as Frobelians, we have to, to stick to our principles and we have to know that we, we will meet resistance. I think there's a lots of literature out there now on the benefits of, of outdoor play for children. And I think as we progress, we will see more um, on, you know, outdoor learning spaces in higher education. I know there's a few in higher education settings coming up around Ireland as well um, and, and being creative. So, you know, our colleagues in Manute, they they were really stuck for space. So they they have a, a roof garden um, and that was a really clever way to, to, to bring that idea in and, and really just to, to push the ideas forward, use the research that's there. And I think even in the, the Forbelian community and social media, we can see an awful lot of, of of really wonderful ideas coming through. So I think there's lovely research within the, the Forbel Trust, there's plenty and, and beyond, uh, and using the kind of um, evidence to, to convince people of, of the benefits of, of outdoor learning spaces. Yeah, if I can add to that, just how powerful is the student's voice? Um, and, and obviously Marcella and I have been able to cap capture that. and. Um, Marcella will say, you know, having those doors open um, throughout the whole of the workshops in uh, in our Irish weather, um, we had to win over the students, or Marcella certainly had to win over some of the students. But um, the rich data that's just come out with, of their reflections when they got past that um, is obviously uh, people can now take forward and, and use, you know, the research is there. So if anybody's thinking of doing it, uh, you've got our report and some research there um, for you to use. Thank you, Alison. That's really helpful because there are quite a few comments asking for examples of the reflective maps. And that's helpful to see that that's actually in the documentation of the report. So individuals can go there and, and, and review at their, their leisure. Um, another question that has come through is for yourselves about is there anything that you would change or anything that you would do again in the future uh, from, you know, the results and the findings of the project? I, I think we, we just mentioned in the report, um, I suppose we did we did try and do too much, though. We we had an abundance of data, so we kind of went for breadth rather than depth. Um, and, and that was lovely and, and lovely rich data, but when it, when it came to confining it within a word count, so... So maybe not not trying to do too much. So we, we thoroughly enjoyed all of it, all of the focus groups, um, you know, the reflective maps, the journals, but it was a huge amount of data then. So Alison, would you like to add anything there? Um, now, I think with any research that we all do, it's the timing, of course. Um, we, we were very lucky that students would take part in what was a very busy time for them. 
and without labouring about COVID, we we're all fully aware of the experiences that the students had uh, during that time. And we were very conscious um, of the students that were coming forward uh, into their first year and being mindful of that. So I suppose all I'd be saying is, and, and all of us are very conscientious researchers, but just be think beyond uh, that they're student participants and they're on the course. There's a lot of lived experiences that these students have had before they come to us as first years. So I suppose uh, as researchers, we've just got to be really mindful of all that that might be impacting them when they take part in our research. Yeah, and maybe if I could just add to that, because Alison, you've raised a really interesting point there around COVID, and it's something I didn't touch on this evening. But when we conducted the research, it, it was beneficial to have the doors open anyway, because it's a very new room and it's very well insulated. And the C when the doors were closed, the CO2 monitor used to spike within about seven minutes. So the doors were open, which, which kind of helped with that and, and encouraged us to out. But when we conducted that research in the workshops, and I was looking back at photographs, students and myself, we were still wearing masks and I had completely forgotten about that in the time. And when they were outdoors, they take off the mask but because they were going in and out, then they felt it was maybe easier to just leave them on because when they'd come in, they have to put them on. And just to talk about maybe the practicalities of that in COVID, um, because the materials were going in and outside um, and things would be brought in and out. So anything that was going to be brought back in at the end of the day, every single thing had to be sanitized. So I had to sanitize every single thing. And when I had two groups on the go, just to say it, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't all plain sailing. We had to have two sets of, of, of materials available. So, so that COVID context is good. And I think um, it, it's important, as Alison said, the relationships that those students built up. And it does come through in the report in that section on relationships that, you know, they were coming out of a time when they were maybe kept from their peers and now they were in college and those small work groups in the outdoor space, freely roaming and maybe playing and interacting, it gave them a real opportunity to reconnect with people and, and to get to know their classmates as well. So, so you know, it was it was really relevant to the research, and we've kind of forgotten that element as we go. That's really helpful because do you feel that that was a way that you a strategy strategy that you used to win over the students in that sense to participate in the research? Um, I don't know, but it was Alison really was involved in the recruitment. So I'm I'm not sure because I, I couldn't be involved. I couldn't I couldn't influence my students. I wasn't allowed ethically to do so. Um so I, I don't I mean they were doing those workshops anyway before we recruited them. So it wasn't anything new for them. So I think maybe if they enjoyed that 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 helped. If they enjoyed the, the indoor and outdoor, it did help with, with their recruitment. Wonderful. Um, there is a question here that talks about models of reflection and uh, would you encourage others or do you use any other reflective models such as Kalb or Moon to give students another framework to use? As far as um, Marcella might talk about first years and what they, what they have, but once they come into second years, so they come into the September, and they're going out on placement in the January. Um, so they have they have about 10 to 12 uh, weeks of uh, preparation for placement modules. Um, and there we definitely introduce um, a number of reflective models um, that they can then go and research and, um, and use. Um, because in their portfolio, then in the second year, we're asking them to write uh, five reflective um, entries of what their experiences are on placement. Um, and they also have two large key reflective entries. So they build on those smaller ones. So absolutely, we are, long story short, <laughs> but we, we absolutely introduce them to a range of different ways of reflecting um, and different models. Yeah. Marcella, I don't know, in first year, do you? Yeah. So just in first year with those reflective maps. So what I'm trying to get at there before we introduce anything theoretical with them in second year is um, how your thoughts and feelings are so central to reflection. Um, and that's what those reflective maps capture. Um, it, it's not a kind of theoretical thing. It's the thoughts and feelings that come to you in relation to what you're learning. So formally, I don't introduce any of those models. They come into second year. 
But when we get to that stage where I'm introducing the portfolio to them, I have that idea and, and the name um, escapes me now. But I just go with very simple, like what, so what, and now what? So what are you writing about? So what, why is it important? And now what, what are you going to do with it? And there is a, there is a theorist around that, but the name is escaping me. But I just keep it very, very simple and practical and go, I suppose, from the practice up and then it's built on theoretically in the second year of the program helpful and I think it's that strategy for keeping it simple that's so what now what I, I use it myself with students and I think it's highly effective for stimulating that thinking isn't it with students and giving them that space to really reflect and think you know how what are they reflecting on what is it about the practice and then how do they apply the theory so thank you I think we're coming to the concluding um, question here now, really, which is about, do you have any, and I think it's a lovely one to end on, uh, do you have any strategies to en entice any educators that may be reluctant to go out in all weathers? Um, I, I suppose, you know, I, I have to entice students to go out, which isn't easy. Um, uh, but really, when they come into first year, I suppose the idea is this is what we do. So if you're trying to bring this into a group already established, I'm sure it can be problematic. Um, but as regards educators, I would say give it a go. The, obviously, the, the correct clothing is really important and our students learn on the go. They're told to dress appropriately. They don't. But what happens? They get wet, they get cold. And then that's just, you know, experiential learning um, and they learn as they go. So I, I would encourage educators just to give it a go. Um, I don't understand personally how being in nature can't inspire you, but you know, it, it may be different for other people. And um, so I, I would say, yeah, just give it a go. And, and you know, it, we can't stop the rain. It's it's part of life. And um, in Ireland, we have to get used to it. It's, it's, it's practically daily. So um, it, it's just really trying to get used to it and, and, and forget about it. And when you get engrossed in what you're doing, you, you really do forget. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. I think you're absolutely right. I never leave my home there's always a pair of wellies in the boot of my car and a raincoat so and I think we are becoming much more versed to adverse weathers aren't we the rain seems to be ever prevalent and I really like this idea to you know to perhaps bring the webinar to a close that we're all possible possibilitarians is that what you said I really really like that so thank you it's been um you know just some of the closing comments it's that have come through about it being inspirational your work um um and to think about the current and future roles of educators um this idea of reflection every, you know everybody in the audience wants to thank you for that so thank you for a really meaningful and uh, wonderful presentation of your research thank you very much <laughs>